Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, a weekly podcast where we explore the many ways in which weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelanek, and this week we're going to examine the question, is weather a market mover? But you know the drill by now. Before we dive into that main topic, let's hit a few little small sidebars. I wanted to follow up on my comment about Spotify. The podcast is now there. The feed's going into Spotify, doing its thing. I'll put a link in the show notes. Unfortunately, they don't give me a cute little URL with their service that I can easily repeat on the podcast. So catch the link there. I'll add it to the website hopefully in the coming week. You're also going to hear me mention some things with Google, maybe another service or two. There's been a lot of tweaking and modifying going on in the podcast space, if you will. So I want to get all those things ironed out, hopefully all reflected on the homepage at what is it about the weather. But in the weeks I mention it, I'll also put a link in the show notes just to try to make that connection easier for those of you who want to try the different services or update you know, whatever you're doing or however you're pulling in your podcast. Now on the weather front, it was hot. Told you it was going to be hot. It was unpleasant, but it's kind of come and gone now. It's going to come again next week, unfortunately. But in the meantime, I had a neat kind of thunderstorm event roll through the New York City metro area. And, you know, I find it interesting with Twitter. I took a couple lightning shots. Inside one's a little different, you know, with the rain on the window sort of thing. But you know, still nonetheless worth sharing. So I shared one on Twitter. And sometimes you'll post a picture. You think, wow, this is a great picture. And you expect people to like it and comment on it. And you'll get one, you know, a few things here and there. And you go, well, well, that's kind of disappointing. And then you'll put one on there that, yeah, it's an okay shot. But then all of a sudden it gets a lot of uptake. And what you'll realize is a lot of times it's when other people are having the similar experience. And they, of course, want you to in turn like their stuff or retweet their stuff. But in all fairness, there were a couple neat shots. And I will share those in the show notes. One was kind of a neat Manhattan Bridge with a lightning strike, and another was a video around the Statue of Liberty and some lightning activity. So if you like that sort of stuff, check it out in the show notes. Felt bad, though, however, with you know, with all these things, when you get these sort of rain events, there's always going to be some flooding somewhere. And in the community next to me, they have a couple of streets that are just flood prone, flood prone and have been for a long time. But imagine going into the grocery store. This is one of the videos I saw on Twitter. Go in the grocery store, get some grocery shopping done. And you think, actually, you know, good time to do it. During the storm, you're inside, staying out of the weather. You'll come out when it's done. But what if you came out to a car that was like into two or three feet of standing water? After the kind of year we're having, probably not what you want to deal with. So uh, felt bad for them. Guess it's that reminder that yeah, it's good to check the weather forecast before you go. All right, enough about the actual weather. Let's talk about how weather might influence markets. Now, it's been a market year. Anybody who has money in the markets, it's been you know a stressful year for a lot of ways, but that's been a component adding to the stress. We've all watched the market drop off a cliff seemingly, rebound. But we know that there's a lot of uncertainty going on and dealing with that. Makes it a hard time. Makes it on our mind. So you might wonder logically, well, does weather play a role? Right? So someone asked me that. What, what is the connection between weather and markets? And I've also had it on my mind, not from watching it because of everything that's just been going on in this year of 2020. But I've also read a little bit. And I've been watching a TV show called Billionaires on Showtime. You may or may not have seen it, but one of the side benefits of all these free trials that we've had access to lately is I caught that show, and they talk about a thing called quants. And let me give a short version of what a quant is, but it it has to do with analytics related to the financial markets. But think about them as using statistics and data and creating models, but for financial markets to try to outperform and understand what's driving decision-making so that you can, you know, do a better job than just the average person because that's the goal of these companies that are trying to leverage these tools. But modeling and understand modeling has always been fascinating to me, especially when it uses statistics and you know lots of pieces of information. So that's what weather forecasting is about in many cases. So it's kind of like doing forecasting, but for a different space. 
So then you start trying to make that connection again is, well, what role does weather play in that? Might they use weather in their analytics? Might anybody looking at those models evaluate weather and how they might use weather? So you start thinking about it. And of course, with my answer with a lot of these shows, right, is maybe. <laughs> maybe. And you hear me say that and, you know, we'll get into why it's maybe and not a definitive yes or no. But clearly, when you think about weather, there's a logical reason to think it might have a role. And it's understandable. That's my reality. That's how I got my start in, in the field, was examining the role of tropical cyclones in the energy sector, and improving the forecast. 2005, there was a you know, tremendous amount of, of tropical cyclone activity in the Atlantic Basin. And it had a huge role in energy prices. So developing better forecast, or, and it's not just about the forecast. It's about taking the weather forecast information and extrapolating useful information that can be put to use in the decision-making process of those who are protecting assets for making energy or who are trading in the energy commodities. And it's not just in energy. It's easy to see it in some ways, right? Agriculture comes to mind all the time. But there's, you know, you can think about other goods or other sectors. You know, we think about uh, you know, a classic one is the holiday season. And we've got this time between Thanksgiving and Christmas here in the U.S. that always they looked at the weather. You know, first was how many weeks do you have for the shopping season? But the second part of it was do we have winter storms rolling through that are impacting any of the big cities that might reduce, or in theory, I mean, it can improve conditions for retail shopping, Right. And in turn, it might impact those company stocks or the sector as a whole. And whether people buy and trade securities related to those or in funds related to those, there's a real opportunity for effect. But it, those tend to be short-lived and temporary effects, right? So you can look at a specific event and understand how it might have an outcome. And we've talked about it with other things too, not just in the the markets themselves or commodities and pricing. But we've talked about it with things like insurance, etc. But how about more generally than that? How about the way markets behave? So does it play a real role? And we're back to that same thing. Maybe. Right? So let's we 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 we're diving in and let's see if we can't get that maybe to have some more clarity around it. Maybe it's not always a clear thing, but let's see if we can get there. So I was telling you about that quants thing, and one of the things that where I saw it, you know, I saw it on the show, but I was, I've also been reading about something called efficient market hypothesis, and it examines the idea of markets and how efficient markets are to, I don't know, I guess the best way I know to, to kind of convey that is about how, logical a market behaves, right? How rational it is, how it can be modeled or in anticipated, if you will. All right. And in some ways, when you think about efficiencies in markets, some weather elements are going to be factored in from the get go. And, and let's just take, I, I don't know, let's take tourism in it may be a theme park. Right. And a theme park has a given season. Right. And when you're looking at that, you can imagine any given year that the area it's in, it's going to have so many thunderstorms in the afternoons or it's going to the temperatures are going to be in some range. And so the markets anticipate that. And if there's deviations from that, they can anticipate that and actually can probably model fairly effectively that if it's so much warmer or wetter or, or drier or whatever it is for that sector because it's kind of a known thing and that there's plenty of historical data to work with. You can model what the impact might be on revenues, on profits, and work those in to the efficiencies of the market. 
But is there something more fundamental there? Is there something that's making it maybe not be an efficient market? Maybe it's making it, you know, because one of the things that we've got to remember about the way markets move is no matter what end of day, there's people involved still. And whenever we get people involved, there's a lot of, I mean, you you hear from time to time, irrational exuberance is one that's thrown around with markets, but people don't necessarily behave rationally. So does weather have the ability to displace rational behavior in such a way? I mean, here's the goal, though, is you, you might want to know that information so that you can anticipate how people are not going to behave rationally, right? That, that, was, that would be kind of the idea, is if you can model that weather is going to, or weather behaviors or patterns are going to make people do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do, there's an opportunity to leverage that. So this is a topic that's not new and being studied. Right, it's been studied for, as I found, and that that was the interesting thing is I found lots of examples of it being studied over the last fifty years. But the outcomes always seemed very focused on not all of them, but the vast majority were very focused on the idea of whether there was a lot of clouds or whether it was very sunny. And one of the early ones that seemed to show some relationship had to do with cloud cover. All right. How much cloud cover there was in a day. And and one of the first kind of well-known papers examined it for New York City with the thought process being is that's where, you know, huge market, a lot of traders there coming into a centralized location. They could examine weather around that. And what they found was the, the one finding they found was not so much sun had an impact, sunny days. But cloudy days tended to make people more depressed and they would tend to exit what might be a slightly riskier investment. Then on the flip side, some more recent research looked at it from a sun standpoint. And they found that, and one of them, some of them are very specialized. Some of them have looked at places like you know, there was one for Istanbul in Turkey, one for another in Athens that looked at the individual country. But one looked at a broader thing, and I think it was like 26 locations. I don't remember the exact number around the globe where a lot of the big markets are, whether you look at places like Shanghai, Hong Kong, or there's places like London, where, wherever it might be, New York, just around the globe where a lot of the big markets were. And what they found is they had the sunshine effect, which is with a lot of sunny weather, people tended to be make riskier choices, you know, would put money in things that they wouldn't otherwise put money in. And we're not just talking about people like you or me. We're talking about people that are buying huge amounts of some asset or some security, whatever it might be, right? So something that is enough to influence, truly influence market price. But in the midst of all that, I, I, I found a roundup in a, kind of a summary article in Investopedia. And I found a statement they made particularly interesting and noteworthy. They had a statement that said, however, <laughs> let's think about this, however, further review found that weather was a much smaller predictive variable than whether or not the trading day was on a Monday, right? So they highlighted there this challenge that we have with basic statistics that is, do we have this causal relationship? And the idea, yeah, let's throw out something simple. Let's say, you know, for the months of June and July and August that Bob eats croissants every day and the rest of the year he eats oatmeal or non-croissants, if you will. It doesn't matter. And so your instinct may be, oh, he likes croissants when the weather's warmer, right? It's a logical thing to think. It, it, you know, it could hold. I mean, if, if Bob's been doing that for 30 years, you go, wow, that's, that's predictive. When we get to you know, the summer season, Bob really likes croissants. 
But then you come to find out that the bakery that Bob buys croissants at, it's the only one he thinks makes a proper croissant. And they're only open in the summertime because maybe that people come in during the summer, you know, it's a, it's a locale that's focused on people in the summertime. Now you could argue that weather's still an influence because of that, but it's not a direct relationship. The direct relationship, and he's never thought about it. Bob would buy croissants year round from this bakery if it was open. So it's not the weather influencing his decision, even though in this case, the summer season is when it's open. And so you could say weather had an indirect impact, right? So this gets into understanding the cause and effect. And we see this with other things too. And you'll hear about it from time to time when people talk about statistics is you'll have item A and it may be highly correlated or have a very strong relationship or seeming relationship to item B, but there's no obvious reason for it. And so without having that causal connection, you can't really say, oh, I'm going to make a definitive decision. Or you shouldn't. I mean, that, that, that should set up little red flags. So we get back to this thing of how do you know whether it's really doing it? Because all those studies, there are a couple of interesting things to hit me about these studies. But all of them were built around the idea of weather impacting mood. And that's already a tricky thing to do. Because, as you know, from hearing me talk, how weather impacts me might be very different from how it impacts you. The things I like, you may just, it may drive you nuts. So to try to make those connections, even though there might be some weak connection or even a slightly stronger connection, you have to wonder if there's enough validity to it or enough data exposure to have said, I can definitely extrapolate this relationship, right? Or can you even make that guess, okay? So let's think about this from two perspectives. Like I said, th this, is, this is the thing where we could go down a, a, a wide array of rabbit holes, but I want to focus on just a couple of small rabbit holes. One has to do with the idea of the weather data that was used in this in almost all the analysis that I saw, most of them used station data from tends to be the local airport nearest where the exchange was or, or wherever there might have been a you know a, kind of an, an automated or you know well documented weather station location near where the market was. So it's very point focused. And, you know, they're talking about things like cloud cover. And I want to say that until, I mean, I, I've read papers about how many countries and locations didn't use what we would consider automated ways of measuring cloud cover. One, because it's not that easy to automate, but didn't, haven't used it until the last 20 years. So some of these things were somebody going outside and saying, yeah, that looks like about 50% cloud cover to me. Now, I, don't get me wrong. I think there's a little more to it than that. But nonetheless, so there's already this opportunity for you got to wonder what the accuracy is, right? On a variable like that, this is not something that's measured on an instrument necessarily. And on the flip side of it, you don't know where the, they're, they're talking about people's moods who may have taken a train in or drove in and, you know, could have had very different weather even on their route in. And, and what time of day is the weather, you know, that's influencing them? Is it when they went out for lunch? Is it when they drove in on their commute? Are you sure it was the weather and that influenced them? You know, what, what variables are you even looking at? And like I said, so cloud cover to me is more problematic than something like temperature. But even things like time period, I mean, and, and I say all these things because I think, have worked enough with weather data to know how challenging it is. And almost all of the analysis being done has been being done from people that think about things from a financial per perspective. So they know the market side of data, but maybe not so much the weather side of things. And this was highlighted by a little thing I found that's actually, I'm going to put this in the show notes. Um, I think the, person's name is um, Bernard Ong. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. It's O-N-G. And he did something for a shorter time period. 
where he did it for New York again, and he looked at different variables, and his outcome wasn't different. He didn't find anything that was cloud or sun related. He found it related to temperature, but certain times of the year, it was a positive relationship. The other time it was a negative relationship. But even as I was looking at it, one of the things I liked about him is he's got his little model. You can go play with it yourself. As I started looking at the time periods, I realized that he ran into some of the challenges the other people did, which is he didn't find pulling the weather data automatically an easy thing to do. Well, actually, I know how to do that, but yeah, somebody who's not used to dealing with the weather data may not see it that way. But the outcomes seemed very sensitive based on even the conclusions he drew, which he, he admitted were, you know, this is the strongest thing I found, but it's here's a reason it might be. You know, he threw out a theory. But if I went from one year to the next, I saw the relationship change. He talked about, you know, how things were, but, you know, in the winter time going into the spring and summer and how it, you know, it showed a certain signal, if you will. Of a, of a relationship or strength of a relationship. Yet, if I looked at one year, it was different from the year after, which was different from the year after, and he only had done a few years. And if I narrowed it down to, took January out of the mix, let's say, it, it may have had a big impact one year, not others. And so we run into all these challenges that anytime you do statistical analysis, it, there's some basic premises. One is you always want as many data points as possible. So him only having three years of data, you have no idea what happened in those three years. And like I said, when I played with it, one year was meaningfully different from another. So when we do modeling in the weather space, we want lots of data points. And I worked with someone who did these sort of things with the tropical cyclone modeling, if you will. And one of the things we used to have to do was try to create a larger data set when you don't have enough data because when we're looking at the possibilities of outcomes you need to make sure that there's a reasonable representation of all the possible outcomes and it's the same thing with this type of analysis yet when you only have a few cases you start to ask yourself all right are they representative or as I found out are there sensitivities around the edges or the time frames you pick and that's always a big kind of red flag that it may not be enough right? So in my mind, the statistics point to maybe, maybe there is a relationship, but it also points to the fact that there's real challenges that the logical thing to do might be looking at, instead of looking at temperature itself. And this is one of the things I found when I was looking at this little model, maybe it's about the anomalies of temperature. Maybe just like with other things, as I mentioned before, the idea of whether it's cooked into the process or the prices of, of that the market is portraying. But sure, if it's a particularly warm spring and it's making people feel good about the summer that's coming, maybe that does have an influence on enough people that are making decisions about the market. But the other thing I found that was interesting is nobody had kind of taken this analysis from step A to B. And that's where I think the, the real kind of, well, maybe thing comes for me. And I'm going to give you an example here to kind of point this out. When I did a, my master's thesis, I was able to look at something where I was trying to determine the predictability of snowmelt season in the spring and the timing of it because it has a real impact on a variety of things. And I did some analysis and looked at, you know, I was looking at more longer lead times. Does something in the broader, you know, you've probably heard mentioned El Nino, La Nina. Does that have some sort of predictability power if those patterns exist on what the seasonal snowpack behavior might be? Not just in terms of the volume, but the next season's spring timing. And as I was examining all these things, I found some relationships, some that were worth you know, consideration. And I could hypothesize about why it is that A may lead to B, right? But the benefit of a master's thesis is I didn't have to go too deep into that and prove it. However, 
If you do PhD work, that's usually precisely what you're doing. <laughs> so you make that next step and you've got to prove it. And none of these things did I find that proving factor take place. None of them. Which, there's two reasons I can see for that. One is all these people that were doing it were really more about, they were financial analysts and really didn't know how to take that next step. They even, you know, when you see what the, they're working with a very basic weather data. They're working with point data at these little stations not patterns that might influence a whole metro area, which is really what you'd want to do. You'd want to look at the behavior over a longer period of time and have higher resolution and examine those things with products that are much more sophisticated at at painting a whole picture. So it's A, they didn't have that, or B, the people that they had done it, they had taken that step, and they didn't find that they could come up with an independent causal relationship. Because when you think about moods and you think about weather influence on moods, you heard the quote about Monday, right? It's like, well, maybe it was the day of the week. So maybe you can only explore Tuesday through Thursday, which are considered more routine days to explore weather. Or did the weather where the the reporter who was reporting the news story that influenced the market, you know, what was their mood? So it may just not be that simple. Is it neat to think that weather might do it? Sure. It's neat to think that weather might have an influence on markets. Is it possible that it does? Oh, sure. In addition to the ones I mentioned where it's obvious, is it possible that weather moves markets? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, Would I go and make an investment decision based on it with the data I've seen so far? No, (laughs) probably not. However, what's intriguing about it is there's enough information there that it's the type of project that I think is interesting because I've got a background in both of those spaces and I could see ways to analyze those things. But I also see the complexities and challenges of getting to any sort of definitive answer. And it may just not be worth the time spent. So does weather, is weather a market mover? Yeah, sometimes. It clearly is. I pointed those out before we got into this hodgepodge of information. Is it obvious in terms of a broad scale one? No, it's not obvious. All the research I saw, it shows that it's possible, but it's not obvious. So if you want to think that Uh, sunny days influence enough traders to move the market or cloudy days to just the opposite do it in an opposite way there's papers to support the idea but i would say that the data is still very inconclusive all right so i mentioned rabbit holes i got enough of all this like i said we may pick this topic up in the future and i think it's worth doing i mentioned rabbit holes so let me just mention this this one that i found on this I talked about cloud cover, and there was an instrument that I don't have much familiar information on, just because it's not one that I ever had cause to use or come across. And it's called a salometer, like is in ceiling, and it does measure cloud cover. And these, as I as I talked about in the podcast, it used to be someone just went outside, and kind of did this. Now they can actually use an instrument that you can look at it and get reflective light back and make an estimate of cloud ceilings. And that's where the term comes from because you're trying to get an understanding around airports. Logically enough, we talked about this recently of what the cloud behavior looks like for planes coming in and taking off. But the newer items, these automated systems, it's kind of neat that how they go in there and do that. But I, I, you know, I wasted a whole, all this time understanding when these systems started becoming automated, the different types of techniques that are used. Again, if you're into weather equipment or tech or stuff, it's worth it. I put, I'll put a little link in the show notes that talks about this stuff. But the other one that really made me laugh was I had cause in this thing to talk about cause and effect, right? And I was, I'm always reminded in English being the goofy language it is of effect with an A versus effect with an E. And so I was doing a little, you know, type in thing to make sure I was using it right. And I went in and it sent me to dictionary.com. And what was funny about it, then, you know, it was telling you when to use either, but it was using the example, you said, you know, when weather affects the crops. And so here it goes. Weather was the example that they used. All right, enough of all this. I've rambled on long enough. I hope you found something useful in all this. Give me your thoughts, your ideas, your comments. If you want me to take this in some direction that I didn't cover or you think you heard some nugget that would be useful you'd like to hear me follow on about, don't hesitate to let me know what is about the weather at gmail.com. But until then, as you're pondering all this stuff or whether you're pondering something more simple or even more complex, 
the important thing to remember, as we've talked about again and again, don't ever forget there's much more to weather than the weather itself. <laughs>